Well, well, basically, I hope I'm making some sense. Not a... And so, in the uh, later parts of uh, Being in Time, which incidentally was meant to be a two volume book, but he didn't write the second volume. He discusses what he calls the onticle, the region of beings, entities, and the ontological, the region of being. And he suggests that the question of being has both ontical and ontological priority, that this must be answered before we can do anything else in, in philosophy. Uh, basically, or for that matter, in the natural sciences and social sciences and so on and so forth, but uh, he does not have the traditional philosophical uh, ambition of uh, making philosophy into a founding discipline for all possible knowledge. He does not have that ambition at all. Uh, in, in, in the region of ourselves as beings, with uh, our everyday life, uh, our facticity, etc., in as much as we do have, as we have seen, a pre-ontological, unsystematic, pre-understanding of what it means to be, and in as much as we do sometimes, at least, want a systematic answer to the question of being, in our being as beings, the question has priority. That is the ontical priority of the question of being. He later will argue about the ontological priority of the question of being, where he will discuss whether philosophy can ever really be the founding discipline and so on and so forth. <coughs> and uh, that's that detail I don't think uh, I will go into because this is basically a, a, a discussion of various forms of knowledge which are dependent on uh, and derived from an unsystematic understanding of the question of being. Please note how the ontical priority of the question of being dovetails into the notion of Dasein. As beings, we are concerned with our being, and therefore, as being there, the, that question has priority. I should again make a few terminological comments. Why does he not say simply human being or existence, which is what the word Dasein usually means? <clears throat> Why play with words and meanings and complicated issues? Why can't just be simple about things? However, terms like uh, human being, human reality, existence are historically determined. They have a specific historicality. Humans are those beings that were made out of humus, out of clay. The goddess Cura, care, happened in her own careful manner to shape some clay into a particular shape, and she and other gods were pleased with that shape. So Jupiter gave it breath, etc. This is rather obviously a European thing. <clears throat> uh, Indians and Chinese and Brazilians and Mayans and Aztecs, in fact all non-Europeans, do not share this. They all have different words and concepts uh, for the phenomenon that Europe understands historically as being human and human being. I have a short story to tell you here. I don't know if you know, but the place where I teach, uh, now called Savitri Bhai Phule uh, Pune University, has um, a large number of foreign students from various regions uh, of, uh, of the globe. Uh, so there was a point in time when, uh, in my class, uh, there was a Thai student, there was a Malaysian, there was a Kazakh, there was a Tajik, there, were, there was a Finn, there were two Germans, and there were, of course, Marathi-speaking, proud Maharashtra people, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? And there were, of course, as always in most uh, universities, uh, students who thought they were from the so-called um, rural area, uh, underprivileged, um, self-victimizing, and, and that uh, gamut, as they say, of, of, of uh, population. And one of the um, students was arguing with me about what it means to be human. And uh, I suddenly, happens once in a while, right, once in 10 years or something, uh, I twigged onto the fact that I had a lot of foreign students. And so I, what I did was I asked them, each of them, 
to write the word for human being. And there was a Chinese student as well. And, and you just write it on the blackboard. And so um, you had, uh, oops, I'm sorry. So, <clears throat> uh, French, uh, the jana in brackets, right? It's the same sort of thing that's going on. Uh, Mana uh, mention, I believe, in German, Lom uh, in French. Um, Etc. Etc. And the Chinese student, and this is really something that I really would like you to pay attention to, writes this. And I uh, ask my students, I don't actually, I'm not a asking question type. I told the students, this is what you are. You think you're a human being. This is what you are. This is you in Chinese, right? So, <laughs> naturally we asked the Chinese student Wang, uh, what does this mean? And she said, this means somebody is walking. Somebody is walking. That is what being human means, to walk. Right? And so, uh, uh, obviously, this 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 European thing about human being uh, and 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 humanity and humanitarian and humanism and all that um, sort of gets uh, somewhat uh, shrunken, if I may say so, right? Uh, and naturally, all the non-Europeans do exist. This is not a matter of linguistic or historical relativism. Though these might be some of the elements that go into such a thinking and hamper it. As uh, Joseph Lovens has pointed out in an essay on Heidegger and language, Russian, for example, does not need the copula to form a sentence. In Russian, instead of saying, I am, I am an engineer, one says, I engineer, ya yeah, engineer. Does this mean that they do not have the notion of existence? Heidegger insists that to understand Dasein as a human being, or human reality, or existence, is incorrect. In fact, in his later writings, he suggests that even in being in time, there was a residual element of being human in his treatment of Dasein. In short, human being is one historical, and therefore possibly optional, interpretation of Dasein. Amongst many other characteristics of Dasein, the prominent one is that it exists in a world. But this being in the world is not like being a chocolate in a box, water uh, in the bottle, a dress in the cupboard. Heidegger reinterprets the spatial understanding encoded in the in. And this is what he writes. Nor does the term being in designate a spatial in one another of two things objectively present, any more than the word in primordially means a, special, a spatial relation of this kind. In stems from inan, to live, habitare, to dwell. An means I am used to and familiar with, I take care of something. And that, I think, is, 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 is a, a very interesting sort of uh, understanding of uh, what otherwise we think of as, you know, the, there's water in the bottle, there are, must be things in uh, the, the shelf, and so on and so forth. And eventually, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the steps here, but eventually being in the world will also come to mean being with as well, mit sein. But this witness is not merely the objective spatial contiguity of two 
objectively present things like the pen, the marker, and the bottle. That their being contiguous with each other is different from the way uh, we are with uh, other people. Uh, at this point, uh, allow me to uh, introduce how Heidegger uh, tries to understand things. And this is still being in time, 1927. Uh, do remember that he died only in 1976. So there's 50 years of work uh, yet ahead. And as I was telling uh, Professor Dasgupta uh, that um, the, the, the number of volumes in his complete works as of now is 102. There's no way anybody can give you an introduction <laughs> to, to, to what he wrote. Uh, there are things in the world, some of which are, for the lack of a better word, usable and useful, others which are merely there, objectively present. Objectively here means object-like. Those who know German might be able to explicate this better. Therefore, I give you the German terms, uh, Zuhandenheit and Vorhandenheit. These have been understood in a variety of ways, some of them rather complex, and the translation too has been a matter of debate and concern. One translation proposed by uh, an American uh, scholar, almost an, uh, treated as an authority on, on Heidegger, uh, for Vorhanden is a current something that occurs. The earlier McQuarrie and Robinson translation, which you find uh, on the shelf, uh, uses uh, ready to hand for zuhanden and being at hand or present at hand uh, for forhanden. The idea seems to be that there are some things that are, uh, which are there for our handling, handen. Others, uh, do remember that handen, with an L at the, before the last N, uh, is, is, uh, could be a shop. Uh, others which are merely there, possibly in a quote-unquote meaningless sort of a way. Along with Dasein, then, we discover the world as well, and being in the world means to dwell in it, to inhabit it. Clearly, this is a reinterpretation of space-time as well, since we are in the world, but do not merely occupy a certain material bodily volume in space the way a mountain or a stone does. We dwell in it, we think in it, we exist in it. Another element of Dasein is that it understands itself in terms of its possibilities. And this is a very powerful idea, I think. Uh, this is what makes it basically future-oriented. We are what we are always in anticipation of what we will be. This takes us outside of a, a simple sense of a delimited, well-defined, stable self. This makes us, as Heidegger puts it, ecstatic. To use Heidegger's term, literally, outside of the stasis that one thinks one is. Possibilities, futurity, uh, generate choice. And choices not made produce angst. Now, for people of my generation, this is, is such a familiar word because people of my generation were uh, very often had friends who, uh, who came in the middle of the night some, uh, somewhat high on some form of intoxication uh, and said they were suffering from angst. This is the, um, uh, this is the uh, I don't know, this is the Maharashtra, Pune, Mumbai version of something that they thought was existentialism. And uh, I hope you realize that I have not uh, even mentioned the word existentialism uh, uh, until now. Uh, Heidegger normally is thought to be an existentialist, whatever that means. Uh, we'll come to that a little later. Choice also generates questions of authenticity and inauthenticity. Most of us, uh, this is somewhat dubious part of uh, being in time and Heidegger, some of us, most of us live in an inauthentic manner, as far as Heidegger is concerned, because we allow others to make choices for us. We live according to what Heidegger, Heidegger calls the they, uh, the German term, the das Mann. Amongst the various possibilities that are there for, and perhaps even as Dasein, however, there's one which is certain, and therefore not really a possibility, but a certainty. 
but in as much as it is not an actuality, it is a possibility. This is the possibility of the impossibility of Dasein, death. It's only when we constantly bear in mind that we are constantly and incessantly moving towards death that we will have an authentic resolve to exist and only after that will, will we be in a position to make authentic choices. Our being towards death, that's, that's a phrase that he coins, being towards death, uh, will somewhat paradoxically generate resolute existence. And this, this bit about death and choice uh, is, is what uh, many people in the 20th century uh, thought of as the major contribution that Heidegger had to make uh, in the general framework of some understanding of what they called existentialism, uh, drawing a sort of lineage between from Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, uh, Heidegger, uh, Karl Jaspers, um, Gabriel Marcel, um, Jopal Sartre, big figure for many Indians, and uh, and Albert Camus. So. Uh, uh, the, the parts of being in time in which he discusses these and related issues have perhaps been the most influential and the best known. In the early reception of Heidegger, the observation that we only can experience others' death, never our own, was thought to be very incisive. Our death is not something that we can experience, therefore it is not a part of our life, but it defines our existence. This was the existentialist understanding, which was, as I said, by far the most dominant understanding of Heidegger for a long time. <coughs> However, uh, I hope to show that there are other things in Heidegger which are possibly more ex interesting than existentialism. Having given you some idea of what Dasein is about, I will now move on to some other issues that Heidegger mentions in the introduction. I'm still, uh, I, I hope you realize that I'm still talking about what he says in the introduction. I have not yet gone on to what he actually says in the, in the main text of what he calls the analytical design. Uh, I should also tell you that many people divide Heidegger's career into two, the early Heidegger and the later Heidegger. These are uh, supposedly separated by a turn in his thinking about around the time when he wrote his two-volume book on nature. Uh, translated uh, into English as four volumes. If being in time is definitive of the early Heidegger, then the essays, the origin of the work of art, uh, question concerning technology, and the books Time and Being, and Underway to Language, and also a series of public open lectures that he delivered, uh, later collected together as what is called thinking, are indicative of the later Heidegger. Right? But as I've already said, there are 102 volumes, and it is completely misleading to say that this or that is definitive. So amongst the other ideas that are interesting, one is that of the relationship between beings and being. This relationship is that of difference, what he calls the ontico-ontological difference. This relationship of difference implies, on the one hand, that when we focus on beings, uh, being disappears. It's, it's like, uh, I don't know, that this... If, when you look at this picture, these pictures, what do you see? You see people, right? So that the, the uh, two-dimensional quality of the image disappears. You see people. You don't see light being projected. You don't see the play of machines that is actually producing this. You see a building. You just saw a building. Uh, you see Elizabeth Blochmann, who, with whom Martin Heidegger had a relationship and possibly a child, uh, they had what they call an open marriage and so on. Uh, this, is, this is the point. You, you, see, you see his Hutta, you see him uh, and so on. But what, what is there actually in front of you? What is there in front of you is a, a flat screen onto which light is being projected. And that is producing images. You don't see that because you see people. Right? Uh, my favorite example for this is, you know, you look at, uh, I don't know, you look at um, average Durer, uh, you see a landscape, you see a rabbit, you see blades of grass. Um, 
Along comes Malevich in the early 20th century and paints a picture called uh, White on White, which is a large white rectangle with a small, less white rectangle painted onto the white rectangle, white on white. What is the point? The point, of course, is there's nothing to see in a painting. Because when you look at a painting, you're not looking at a painting, you're looking at objects, you're looking at people. The painting disappears as, as, as a painting. So you see objects represented and things like that. So it's, it's something like that. Uh, because uh, at one place, uh, Heidegger talks of light and the objects that the light reveals. Because we see objects, we cannot see the light that reveals them. The light becomes invisible, hides itself from us. More specifically, this, uh, the relationship between beings and being, between Dasein and being, is uh, that, of, uh, that of understanding. And this, this is the bit that uh, he owes, in a certain sense, to Wilhelm Dilthe. This is a hermeneutical relationship. This is a, a, a relationship of interpretation. Since Dasein, as a being, attempts to understand what is the meaning of being, we have also seen that we do have a kind of understanding before understanding, pre-understanding, understanding before understanding, of what is the meaning of being. As I have already pointed out, this many people think of this as negative, as, as blocking proper knowledge. Um, but he turns it into a positive thing and calls it for understanding, a kind of for having. This is also something of a departure from the traditional rational enlightenment notion that knowledge must be derived from a position of uh, without, any posi uh, without any prejudices, without any prejudgment. This is also partly a departure from the bracketing that Husserl uh, had discussed so productively. The suggestion seems to be that uh, we do not have to abstain. And this is, I think, a really interesting idea. The, the suggestion seems to be that we do not have to abstain from knowing what we know already in order to know more systematically and philosophically. For it is clear that unless we have some notion of what we want to know about, our inquiry, remember the structure of inquiry, our inquiry will never ever begin because we will not know what to ask or as the discussion of the ontical priority shows, whom to ask. Another interesting line of thought <coughs> is about things. He points out that things are rarely isolated things. They have relationships with other things. The spanner belongs to the toolkit. The hammer belongs to the nail. These relationships have a certain structure, what he calls assignments, which reveals itself along with the essence of the thing when the thing breaks down. This is an interesting idea, again. When the hammer breaks, the essence of the hammer reveals itself just as it reveals itself in the act of hammering a nail. However, in the act of hammering, the hammerness of the hammer disappears. The object disappears in the event. Think of the game of cricket. The keeper has just collected the ball and it's being transferred to the bowler. This ball is not in play. Think about the no ball or the dead ball. Even though it is moving from keeper to fielder to bowler, it is not in play. It's just a spherical object with a specific mass that is being transferred to the bowler. But when the batsman has just hit the ball, the fielder has fielded it and is throwing it to the bowler in order to get the batsman run out, that ball is in play. It is not merely a spherical object with a specific mass that is being transferred merely to the bowler. The ballness of the ball disappears when it is in play. It's only when the ball breaks down that the ballness of the ball shows itself. The same uh, object, like the cricket ball, seems uh, to be capable of occupying two different modes of being. It is perhaps uh, my, my, my uh, not my conjecture, but my suspicion, I should say, that the notions of Zuhandenheit and Vorhandenheit uh, are possibly related to this. <coughs> and
and this might be yet another way to understand the difference between being and beings. These ideas will later find a transposition to the realm of art in later Heidegger. Uh, later Heidegger is, is more concerned with art, poetry, uh, than philosophy and, and so on. Uh, partly in the essay, uh, The Origin of the Work of Art, uh, where he discusses how Van Gogh's painting of a pair of shoes reveals the essence of the shoes. Yet another notion will acquire great importance, that will acquire great importance subsequently is that of what he calls destructing the history of Western metaphysics. It is to be noted that the meaning of destruction here is literal, it means unbuilding. This is not uh, placing a dynamite at the weakest spots of the building and lighting, lighting it up. This is taking it apart brick by brick. To be able to do that, one must know how it was built, how it was put together by studying the building. This is very hard to look at a product and identify the step-by-step -step process of putting it together. This is not mere criticism or negative judgment or simple condemnation. This requires sympathy and understanding and tremendous patience with the building and with oneself and needless to say, a lot, a lot of hard work. Heidegger proposes that Western metaphysics has always been a metaphysics of presence. Since time itself is most often understood in terms of the present. The future is moments of presence yet to come. The past is moments of presence gone by. The present is, well, just the present. He will state that from Aristotle onwards, this has been the dominant understanding of time and that it is incorrect. <clears throat> time is not a series of now points. Now, even a moment's pause will show us that the present is really the minuscule gap between the immediate future and the immediate past. Heidegger will speak of time in terms of three dimensions, not in a one-dimensional linearity. He will also transpose the Husserlian phenomenological understanding of time into an element of the analytic of Dasein. We have <coughs> already seen how Dasein is, is, is always ahead of itself, is ecstatic. Apart from the certainty of death, and we are not certain when that would happen, and therefore it might just be a belief or faith. Apart from that, everything else about the future is uncertain, radically unknowable. Time that is thought to be metered by chronometers really has nothing to do with time as experienced. Uh, for my students, I give a, a somewhat trivial, not really trivial, but somewhat simple example. In, 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 in this, uh, I, I wonder if you remember the film called Rangila, <coughs> where uh, the hero is, uh, is waiting at a bus stop for the heroine to arrive, uh, and there's a man sitting reading a newspaper, so he knocks on the newspaper and says, what is the time? And the man says, five o'clock. <coughs> Our hero waits and waits and waits and uh, gets impatient and then again knocks on, on the newspaper and says, kya baja? Abhi na, baja hai. Right? For the clock, it is still five o'clock. For our hero, time has passed. So that's, that's a somewhat childish example, I suppose, but you, know, we can, you can, I'm sure you can think of more complicated examples. <coughs> the conception of time in which it can be measured is a quote-unquote Heidegger's term, vulgar concept of time. And uh, even the scientists seem to adhere to it. When we say we exist in time, we are not being roasted nuts in a tin container called time. Let's ask the question, is there or is there not an unmeasured gap between 24 hours and zero hours? Is there ever really a zero hour? Time cannot ever be really numericalized or mathematized, though counting can become really minuscule. There will always be an unmeasurable gap between one nanosecond and the next one, especially if the chronometer is digital. Remember that in, in, in terms of number theory, the distance between the numbers zero and one is infinitely divisible. 
In the digital world, there is no distance between zero and one. In the beginning, there was only God, he, then he created the world. There was nothing, then there was everything. The six days he worked might just be an apology for not being able to explain that there is a distance between zero and one. He worked for six days, but he could have created the world in an instant. He is God after all. There are only these two numbers, on or off, yes or no. There is no place really for yes, but, or no, but, or just a but. Now that we are talking of science, allow me a digression. Amongst the friends that he had, one was a very famous quantum physicist called Werner Heisenberg, famous for the indeterminacy principle. And I remember someone uh, writing, explicating Heidegger, uh, who wrote that quote, uh, well, this is a quote from memory, right? One way to understand Heidegger is to think of him as giving us a field theory of human existence rather than an atomic theory of human existence. Which is to say, even if we understand ourselves as human, that happens in a certain field, in a certain framework, in a certain context. The same stands for being inhuman. So those of you who might think that Heidegger and Heidegger-dependent thought is relativist, you might have to think again. As I said very early on, perhaps it was in the air. For well, I can think of uh, Ferdinand Saussure as giving us a field theory of phonemes rather than an atomic theory of phonemes. One of the latest books on Saussure suggests that he has a phenomenological orientation. This might be coordinated with the fact that the Prague Linguistic Circle had invited Edmund Husserl to give a lecture on language in 1935, which he gave. To come back from the digression to the main road, then time is not something that we can understand easily at all. In fact, perhaps we do not understand it. Perhaps, as Heidegger suggests, uh, none of the thinkers from Parmenides down understood it. Therefore, we need to understand why they asked the questions that could be answered. And this is, again, methodologically a, a very interesting idea that we'll find um, reverberations and resonances in, in later thinkers as well. That people ask questions, and they generally ask questions that can be answered. And Heidegger suggests that this is a way of avoiding asking questions that cannot be answered. So, uh, therefore we need to understand what, why they asked the questions that could be answered, and what were the questions that they did not want to ask or could not ask. That might, the, might be the meaning of destructing. This is a bit like Althusser, if I remember correctly, suggesting that Marx had answers to questions that Smith and Ricardo could not ask because they did not have an anthropology, a, a theory of what it means to be human, anthropology in that sense. Uh, one could say something along similar lines, that Heidegger has answers to questions that earlier thinkers could not ask uh, because they did not have the question of what is the meaning of being. They did not ask this question. Also, he has a lot to say about the, about the structure of the question. Also, when one asks a question, one wants an answer. There's a dishonest, inauthentic manner of asking question where one knows the answer thoroughly anyway. An authentic question is one in which the answer is not presupposed, and the one who asks really does not know the rigorous answer, not even unknowingly. All that we have when we ask the authentic question is that understanding before understanding that Heidegger calls for understanding and what later Gadamer will call prejudgment or prejudice. This is more or less understandable. But what Heidegger does further is what is really interesting. He suggests that we maintain the question instead of answering it the moment we think we have found an answer. This is actually a fairly radical idea. Most of us spend a large amount of time looking for answers, and mostly we find answers quite easily. That happens because we ask questions easily, so they're answered easily as well. This does not mean that all questions are equally difficult or easy, but almost any question can be made more difficult by refusing to be satisfied with the answer given. This makes some questions almost interminable, 
as happened with Heidegger and the question of being, all his career he spent trying to answer that question, what is the meaning of being? And being in time itself terminates without a definable and clear answer to the question, what do we mean by being? He addresses the question in a variety of ways uh, throughout his thinking. So the task of asking questions involves two difficult things. The first is to formulate the question correctly so that it cannot be answered easily. And one of the easiest questions to ask is, is you take an object and ask, what is this? And I say, this is a marker. What is a marker? A marker is that object which is used to write on the whiteboard. Question answer, question asked easily, answered equally easily. But if you ask a question, what is a thing? What is a thing? If you ask that question, you formulate that question correctly because before you can ask what is this thing, you will have to ask the question what is a thing? What is anything? And that question cannot really be answered easily at all. So that it's something like this that he's trying to talk about. The second is not to be satisfied by the answers we get. Being in time can be seen as an attempt to formulate the question of the meaning of being correctly and as rigorously as possible to him and also an attempt to find answers and probing them beyond the point of satisfaction. Perhaps the third is to appreciate that the moment we feel satisfied with some answer, that uh, moment is going to be a random termination of our inquiry without full disclosure or without full closure. The latter will be developed further in what I'm calling uh, Heidegger-dependent thought uh, that came about after him. It's only when we appreciate these that we can begin to attempt uh, destructing the history of Western metaphysics, which is a metaphysics of presence. Those who talk of Derrida and deconstruction, deconstruction, without all this at the back of their mind, will end up thinking that deconstruction is a kind of literary analysis uh, full of light-hearted jokes and puns and all manner of play with words and syntax. And that's, uh, that actually is the end of my first session. Uh, I had also said in the abstract that I will talk about the letter on humanism and question concerning technology in the second session. However, I'll talk, uh, I don't know whether I'll actually be able to do this in the given time, but uh, let me begin with the letter on humanism. I will talk only about a few quotations from the letter on humanism in order to show how his thinking proceeds and how he begins to distinguish between philosophy. And this is interesting, right? This is a philosopher who has been doing philosophy for quite some time. Now he says, I want to think. Okay. So he makes this distinction between doing philosophy and now, now I want to think. This uh, letter, Letter on Humanism, came about because a, f a French philosophy student wrote a few questions hurriedly on a piece of paper in a cafe in Paris so that uh, they could be given to someone who was going to Germany to meet Heidegger. This student was uh, Jean Beaufray, who retained a lifelong interest and conversation with Martin Heidegger. The letter concerns also uh, response to Jopal Sartre's book, Existentialism is a Humanism and you can imagine by now what he will do with it. This is the text in which he famously uh, writes, language is the house of being. The translation that I'm using, uh, which is something that I pulled from the web, it is uh, not an quote-unquote authorized translation, it is for private circulation among students and so on. Uh, language is the place for being. He has been asked about uh, action and thought. He is explicating the relationship between language, action and thought. When he writes language is the house of being, he tells us later that the of, house of being, is a double genitive. What is a double genitive? This is a very interesting idea. Oops. The language in which we speak of being and the language that being speaks, both are indicated in that double genitive. This is uh, grammatical stuff that he is more than familiar with. 
the of it expresses both the genitivus subjectivus and the genitivus objectivus. Some people write this as the equation language of being, being of language. He also wants us, and this is uh, the more uh, uh, more difficult part of what he tries to say, that this is not, this is not to be taken as a metaphor. This is to be taken literally. Language is the house of being. Now you do whatever you want with it. This is not a metaphor because that's the simplest understanding, right? How, how's, how can language be a house? Language is not substantial. House is substantial. Therefore, the literal meaning doesn't make sense. So the only meaning that can make sense to us is that it's a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. He's saying it is not. Uh, because he also makes this uh, very interesting point that a uh, metaphor can exist only in a metaphysics. And he is quite obviously against Western metaphysics. <coughs> this is what he writes in this translation. Uh, thinking is um, uh, the engagement by being for being. And he writes, I, uh, he writes this in French. I do not know if it is linguistically possible to say both these pa a pour in one, namely, as thinking is the engagement of, in the double genitive sense, engagement of being. Yet the terms, uh, yeah, subjective uh, genitive and objective genitive, uh, yet the terms subject and object are the jargon of metaphysics from which from early on in the form of Western logic and grammar co-opted the interpretation of language. Today, we have only just begun to discern what is actual in the present uh, situation. The freeing of language from grammar, note the words he's using, the freeing of language from grammar by a more original articulation of its essence remains something for thinking and poetry to do. Thinking is not only the engagement uh, in action for and by being in some way, meaning what is actual in the present situation. Thinking is rather the engagement by and for the truth of being. The history of being bears and determines every condition uh, and uh, si uh, human situation uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, its beginnings reach back to Plato and Aristotle. There, think there, thinking itself is valued as a kind of techne, a procedure of thinking over in the service of doing and making. In that case, however, thinking over is already seen with a view to praxis and poiesis. Thus, thinking when taken by itself is not practical. The characterization of thinking as theoria and the determination of cognition as a way of behaving is one already in accord with the technical explanation of thinking. It's more a reactive move to preserve a sort of independence for thinking in contrast with action and doing. Since then, and this is where he's really beginning to move away from what he recognizes as philosophy. It thinks that this will, um, since then philosophy has had to justify its kind of life before science. It thinks that this will most certainly happen by elevating itself to the level of science. Yet these efforts amount to the relinquishment. When philosophy tries to be scientific, for him this amounts to the relinquishment of the essence of thinking. Philosophy is pursued by the fear of losing respect and value if it is not science. This is regarded as a shortcoming which is equated with being unscientific. One thus assesses thinking according to a measure inappropriate to it. This assessment of philosophy not being scientific, etc., etc., thinking not being scientific, uh, this assessment resembles a procedure that would try to evaluate the essence and capabilities of a fish according to how long it is able to live on dry land. For a long time now, for too long, thought has been on dry land. Can we now call the effort to bring thinking 
back to its element, irrationalism. The, the interaction continues and he directly addresses a question. This is what he writes to Jean, Jean Beaufre. You ask, how do we uh, return some sense to the word humanism? Redonner, re-give. How do we return a sense, some sense, uh, one sense, uh, to the word humanism? And Heidegger writes further, this question, from an in, uh, this question comes from an intention to retain the word humanism. I wonder whether that is necessary. Or is the unwholesomeness caused by all terms of this kind not obvious enough? Of course we have been wary of isms for a long time now. Yet the market of public opinion craves over ever for new ones. We are always ready to meet the demand again. And terms like logic, ethics, and physics first turn up soon as original thinking has come to an end. The Greeks in their great age thought without such terms. Not once did they call thinking philosophy. This comes to an end when it withdraws from its element. The element is that out of which thinking is able to come forth to be thinking. The element is what is prevailing, it is what is prevailing. It looks after thinking and thus brings about its essence. Now, this kind of a thing becomes what uh, people dislike very much. That is, begins to sound mystical, sounds, begins to sound like, uh, I don't know, bardic or, or prophetic uh, pronouncements and so on. And, and he can go on and on in this manner. This, these quotations might give you some idea of how uh, the later Heidegger thinks. If I'm not mistaken, this text is from 1949. Allow me to quote further, for this is on the one hand easier to understand than the more difficult parts of being in time. On the other hand, it is the kind of writing that many philosophers, especially those oriented towards logic, discard as not just non-philosophical, non but as nonsense, or mere pretensions, and, and, and as I said, pretensions towards prophetic or even bardic pronouncements. And this is, this is what he writes. Considered explicitly by name, humanitas is reflected on and striven for in the time of the Roman Republic. Homo humanus contrasts with Homo barbarus. Here, Homo humanus is the Roman who exalts Roman virtues, virtus, and ennobles it with the incorporation of paideia taken over from the Greeks. The Greeks are the Greeks of the Hellenic world whose character was formed in schools of philosophy. Humanitas is concerned with erudition and the institution of the fine arts, bona artes, bonas artes. Paedia, so understood, is translated by humanitas. The authentic romanitas of Homo Romanus persists in such humanitas. In Rome, we come upon the first humanism there, it remains, in a sense, a distinctively Roman phenomenon which comes uh, out of the encounter of the Roman world with the education of the late Greek period. The so-called Italian Renaissance of the 14th and 15th centuries is a Renascienta Romanitatis, a rebirth of Roman values. Since Romanitas is what matters here in the Renaissance, it's all about Humanitas and thus about Greek Pedia. However, the Greek world is always seen in its later form and thus uh, as Roman. The Homo Romanus of the Renaissance is seen as the antithesis of Homo Barbarus. But now the inhuman is the presumed barbarity of the Gothic scholasticism of the Middle Ages. Therefore, there always belongs to humanism, historically understood, a studium humanitatis, which in a determinate way reaches back to antiquity and thus also becomes each time. And he is possibly um, being critical of all that type of European philosophy, which he himself also practices many times, that which always seeks to go back to the Greeks. Which in a determinate way reaches back into antiquity and thus also becomes each time 
uh, a revival of the Greek world. This appears in 18th century German humanism as represented by Winckelmann, Goethe and Schiller. Hölderlin, by contrast, is not part of humanism, precisely in fact because he thought the fate of the essence of man more originally than humanism is able to do. Uh, and, and I'll skip a little bit and come to uh, Jean-Paul Sartre had discussed existentialism uh, in, 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 in terms of his famous line, existence precedes essence, to which Heidegger responds thus. On the other hand, Sartre articulates the fundamental statement of existentialism in this way, life precedes what is of the essence. In doing so, he takes the terms existentia and essentia in the sense they have for metaphysics, which since Plato has said that essentia precedes existentia. Sartre reverses this proposition. The reversal of a metaphysical proposition, however, is still a metaphysical proposition. In this form, the proposition persists along with metaphysics in the forgottenness of the truth of being. For though philosophy may determine the relationship between essentia and existentia in accordance with the meaning uh, it had in the medieval period, uh, or the meaning it had for Leibniz, or in some other sense, it still remains to ask, first of all, by which venture of being this differentiation comes before thinking as essentia and existentia. And, and so on. I, I think I will uh, stop here now so that we have about 35 minutes uh, in which we can uh, talk to each other. Because uh, I can go on, I have 10 more pages, we don't have that kind of time. So, did I come to the question? I have two queries. One is, um, do you know what kind of relationship uh, Heidegger had with the Warburg School? Because they are contemporary. Uh, they were Jews and therefore hated. Uh, I mean, they and they were also in the work they had left, Omas, Panofsky, a lot. Now, why I ask this is that um, this anti-humanist line. Do you think that it has to do with some form of? You know, fundamental break with the Warburg School. Um, I'm afraid I don't know much about the Warburg School, but um, if the Warburg School was talking about humanism, then uh, in that sense, yes. But this is also partly informed by by uh, by Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who who was talking about uh, a a kind of uh, mode of being which is. Uh, mm, beyond man, uh, Übermensch, hmm. wrongly translated as yes. over Superman and so on. So I, I think that is closer to the line of his thinking than, okay. than uh, the art school, uh, as it were. But well, it's entirely possible that he was uh, reacting also to them. When you are talking of this language of being and being of language, is it a kind of subjectivity that which we had in Husserl's intersubjectivity? Is this that sort of thing where uh, we have a reciprocal relation between other human beings? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure about that, but because what, what I think he has in mind when he says uh, language of being and treats the of as a double genitive, what he's trying to say is that there are two things actually going on, two, two processes as it were. The language in which we speak of being, think of uh, the, the lambda-like Chinese uh, character, or 
mentioned Lom, etc., etc., and, and Mano and Manusha, uh, Mano Prani, <laughs> all those complicated uh, things. So th that's the language in which we speak of being. But there's a certain language that being speaks that, uh, that is the kind of thing that he is trying to talk about, I think. So it's a kind of meta language that you are saying, no. Um. no why, uh, why say that language speaks, uh, that, that, that being speaks a language? Because being can only be spoken of in a language. Hmm. And therefore, there's a fundamental relationship. Language is the house of being, right? Being. That that thing that is that is something that we actually need to need to understand because um, later on in in the origin of work of art and uh, underway to language and later texts, he's going to say that poetry uh, has the, uh, the, the, the 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 function of poetry. Uh, putting it very crudely, the the, the 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 what poetry does is to preserve being in language. So that uh, it becomes more and more a language phenomenon, but language here, not in the sense of uh, there's an object language and there's a meta language, or there is something called a technical language and, a, and an ordinary language, uh, not in that sense, because his understanding of language is related to what, what he understands as logos, um, separating it from logic. We've already seen how he says that once language is freed from grammar, uh, something can happen. So, uh, and he is deeply, deeply informed and deeply studying uh, poetry, uh, especially Holderlin, uh, Georg Trakl, Stephen Georg, uh, and a uh, few René Char, who was deeply influenced by uh, Heidegger, uh, and so on. So that um, uh, he he is uh, th he he thinks of poetry and, and and thinking, no longer philosophy. Poetry and thinking as two peaks of the mountain, which are very close to each other at the top, but are separated by a huge uh, chasm, as it were. So it is, I think, in that uh, area that he's trying to talk about the language of being in that double genitive sense. But I might, I might be wrong. So thank you. Well, my question is rather crude and coarse. That is, mutual acquaintance between Heisenberg and Heidegger, did that result in any theoretical framework, change in theoretical framework in Heidegger's work, especially in the first phase? <coughs> what I fathom in the second phase, he was rather away from objectivity and jumped into the area of aesthetics, I presume. I may be wrong, but my question is pretty clear, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but as, as I said, I, uh, I don't have much uh, biographical information about uh, Heidegger. Uh, they were friends. Uh, you might think that I'm insinuating that because they were friends, Heidegger had something to say. But uh, Heidegger, he, he, he in fact, uses an essay by, by Heisenberg on, on language and uh, science and so on uh, in order to uh, uh, endorse, as it were, what he himself is saying. So um, that relationship, uh, I don't know much about. So. Uh, it remains uncertain. To me. To uh, me be to, because there might be some text which explores, right, which explores the relationship between Heisenberg and, and Heidegger and so on. And do remember that, uh, that, that uh, Heisenberg himself was accused of being a collaborator for Nazi um, nuclear program where he claims that he actually was instrumental in preventing it from succeeding early. So there are very complicated things going on there. So I don't want to, um, I don't have enough information as the robot says in, in one of the stories by Asimov. I don't have enough information to come to a conclusion. Uh, regarding that authentic existence and inauthentic existence, does Heidegger make a distinction between means and end? I think there was a distinction between means and end, whether you can use somebody to do something for something and uh, human being as an end. The so, categorical uh, imperative from Kant uh, yeah. is what uh, you're talking about, I think. Um, 
the, the, this, this uh, as, as Adorno suspected, this business of authenticity is something to be suspicious about. Because um, one very simple question, uh, who decides what is authentic? One. Two, Heidegger has a solution to that, right? He, he's not going to be answering such questions. He's going to say, well, if you have come to terms with the fact that you are going to die, and you keep that in mind every moment of your life, then you might be in a position to make authentic choices and thus inhabit the world authentically. Right? So it's not, it's not a question of I know something, I lie and therefore I'm inauthentic. No, it's, it's it, uh, authenticity and inauthenticity here are not moral terms. Yes, there's this image of uh, Heidegger and Rudolf Bultmann. Now, it looks to me that this authenticity and authenticity really gets going to the Gadamer line. But authenticity really is the moment of metanomia. When you, when you um, as it were, are that is really the Bultmann, Bultmann view of, uh, of um, a kind of denuded, a denuded religi religious faith where, where the entire mythology of Christianity can be dispensed with. And then you are left with really what you might call Heideggerian question of authenticity. That, that when we enter into authentic life, that is, that is the moment of salvation. So, so that is, I think, something which is very strongly felt also in Gadamer. But I think that even more so because as a theologian, of course, more than Gadamer, Bultmann is, is certainly much greater, much, much more fundamental and, and in much more radical also. And this question of authenticity, I think, is, may, is interestingly posed there. Yes, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I would still think that we, we need to be... Uh, uh, yes very, very careful about notions of authenticity because they can so it's easily... It's a simple idea. It's a, it, 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 is, it is essentially an intuitive idea. It's, it does not... Yeah, it, 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 it's not it, it cannot really be demonstrated. Yes, no, it's not demonstrated. So that's, that's I think, uh, the line to understand that's this right. business. So, okay, this is not really a question. It's a very... Uh, it's not a very well-formulated comment either. But it's actually related to what uh, has been the discussion on authenticity and inauthenticity. I was actually just wondering, you know, when does the question of being become a question for beings? You know, I mean, is there a particular state in which this becomes a pressing question, especially when Heidegger talks about anxiety or fear? You know, I mean, there's a, there, are, there are moments where I think the question of being, maybe with a capital B and beings, they have a very paradoxical relationship. It is very fraught. No, the, you know? the capital, the B with B capital is not something that I will uh, be able to respond to because that's simply a misleading. No, I misleading mean, idea, okay. So. Let, let's just leave that out. But that, that's just a question of being itself, yes. right? That that is a very fraught relationship because to be actually be authentic, to be able to actually think of death as a as a certainty all the time, actually, you know, makes it hard to exist at the same time. But, I mean, how does one exist while being authentic or being towards death all the time? Right. I mean, it, that seems to be a, a, a double bind, no? or some kind of a fix. Yeah, it is, it is a kind of fix, and as I said, paradoxically, if uh, you are able to do it, uh, then uh, you might find uh, what he calls uh, resolute uh, existence. Right. Right. But I'm not sure that there are any moments which could be said to be moments of a, a privileged entry into the question of being. Is no, but moments of anxiety or not, right? The no, but I was, I was actually thinking of the example of the hammer, right? So even if you are a human being, then to be aware of the question of being would then also involve a sense of self breakdown, isn't it? Of, of maybe, I mean, if if authenticity, I'm not sure if he thinks of it in the, in the Sartrean sense also of being, of realizing that one can never be self same. So is that a question of that, that moment of breakdown, where one actually feels ungrounded? Yeah. Well, yes, but in as much as he is also saying that design is ecstatic uh, all the time, uh, I'm not 
And what you're saying is, is makes perfect sense to me that there must be some point of entry. Uh, or rupture, in, in, out of what, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this could be a rupture, but it could right. also be an attachment, as I keep on saying, right. or an adherence. Right. right. So, uh, because it would be a very positive rupture for Heidegger. That's when yes. one actually realizes the question of being all the more. Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm in agreement with you. But I'm, I'm, what I don't want to... Uh, well, uh, let me come out clean. What I don't want to concede is that there are some moments in our experience which are privileged moments which will give us access to the question of being. This can happen anytime. There's no particularly... Yeah, it's not anticipatable. Yeah, it's not anticipatable, but it is also, one can't say how we will have access or there are no privileged accesses to the question of being. It just happens. Right? Something trivial can trigger it off or something major can trigger it off. It doesn't have to be something major all the time, positive or negative. Right? As I said, my trivial examples of why am I here, why am I talking to this person, right? That, that can trigger it off. So, uh, I don't want to say that, that there is some special experience required which will give you access to the question of being. I, I, I don't think that is going to work very well. Because then the question will be, how do we have access to these special moments? Are these necessarily moments of breakdown or joy or ecstasy in that religious uh, frenzy sense? Uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So, I, I would like to think that this can happen in an everyday manner. Because Heidegger keeps on saying that the everydayness of Dasein is what he is really interested in. So it can be an everyday moment, I mean, it can be anything. Uh, I think he has taken this uh, notion from Husserl's life world. Life world. Because you are, in the, uh, you are having certain experiences uh, as a human being in the world. So you are living experiences. It's not any special kind of experience that you are having. Like you are having a relation with other human beings. So we have this relation every day we are having this sort of relation. So maybe he ha he's alluding to Husserlian idea of, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I, life I, world. I, I, I did say that Husserl's idea of uh, life world, Lebenswelt, mm -hmm. uh, is, is something that will find its own configuration in, in Heidegger uh, as early as being in time. Uh, but do remember that uh, Husserl did not particularly care for being in time when he read it. Uh, so saying, yeah, it's okay, but he has misunderstood me. So that's also there. But these productive misunderstandings are all what uh, we are all about, right? So uh, how many... Uh, um, Heidegger was uh, influential for so many people, right? But then he might himself say that these people have misunderstood me. There is a particularly Foucault. There is there is there is a moment in one of his interviews with Foucault where he says, where he's asked, uh, "What about Heidegger?" He's not in this way, but I'm sort of putting it simply. So he says, uh, "Heidegger is very important for me. I have thousands of pages of notes on Heidegger." So the interviewer asks him, "Why didn't you ever write about him?" He says, "It's too important for me to write about." <laughs> And there's a moment uh, in Derita when he says, uh, well, if you want to call me something and if you can't, uh, you, you're not happy with deconstruction, you're not happy with whatever uh, I, I do, then just think of me as a Heideggerian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but these people have taken some of these ideas very much forward, so I think that can actually be kept in mind. The very general way, is when it goes forward, then the, the, the origin often, you know, the, the originator often finds it inauthentic. That is, that is there. It's a, it's a question of style, really. It's a question of style. Yeah, I was curious to know just one thing, sir. Uh, I mean, Heidegger, uh, as we are informed, he became in his, that is later Heidegger, he became interested in uh, Oriental philosophy and this Buddhism, um, Chinese. How uh, important or significant is that? I, I don't know. What, what, what we know is that he was corresponding with some Japanese thinkers, basically. And uh, his, his uh, translator into Japanese, uh, Nishida, 
uh, uh, did correspond regularly with him. And, and uh, quite, a, quite a few Japanese scholars were uh, really interested in what Heidegger was trying to do. As to what Heidegger made of uh, Asian philosophy, it's not clear. Because uh, at one point he is uh, very categorical, uh, and I think correctly so, in stating that philosophy is a European phenomenon. I think he is doing it rightly because he's sounds like an arrogant statement because you know all these uh, easy postcolonials will say what, what don't you think we have philosophy and so on and so forth but uh, that's easy postcolonialism that's not going anywhere uh, but philosophy love of wisdom the way it unfolds in the discipline from I don't know from Parmenides onwards or whatever. Uh, other cultures quite obviously will not have that kind of history and therefore this is going to let us not really provincializing European philosophy but let us keep it to Europe and think of it as European philosophy because otherwise we will be making all kinds of um, uh, categorical and chronological errors so uh, in short I my suspicion is that he does not uh, respond to Japanese or Asian philosophy in general because I don't think he knows. He is responding in his own position as some some Japanese scholar is asking him questions about his own philosophy. He is responding to that. I don't think he is responding to Asian philosophy as such. I, I very much doubt because one of the things that he will want is to know the language. And he, he doesn't know that these languages. So that, that definitely, I, th I think I can be confident about this level of answer. That he, he would want to know the languages before he says anything about Asian philosophy and he doesn't know the languages. So, but uh, it, it, this is remarkable. This is something that happened in, in uh, a friend of mine reported this to uh, me. Uh, this is something that happened in a seminar on whatever deconstruction, something or the other, where a well-known European scholar uh, gave a lecture and um, a, a Chinese student stood up and asked him, uh, but uh, is this not similar to uh, Theravada Buddhism? And the European scholar says, no, it cannot be. And this Asian student, a smart student, says, how do you know? You don't know Theravada Buddhism. <laughs> that's, I think that's a very good answer. That's, problem. Problem that's That really is a problem, sir. Can I just say, though, that he must have been aware of that. 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 He must have Ralph Waldo Emerson and Schopenhauer um, had, were directly and very deeply influenced by Asian philosophers. So I, I'm just wondering, how could Heidegger have been so completely clueless? No, he, he may not have been clueless, but I, I am reasonably sure. I mean, uh, that 102 volumes, right? There might be 10,000 letters about Asian philosophy for all I know, but uh, to the best of what uh, is the work that is available to me and the work that I understand. He is not uh, responding to Asian philosophy. He might have clues, but he's not responding. I, I'm not saying he was clueless. Right? Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, it is, it is, it is also uh, uh, to be uh, thought about as to how much Paul Doisin or, uh, or uh, Schopenhauer uh, actually <coughs> understood of Indian philosophy. I mean, that kind of scholarship, they were great scholars and so on and so forth, but we can have our own uh, doubts, not in the name of our authenticity, <coughs> in the sense that we know best because this is us, not in that sense, but in the simple sense that the kind of scholarship that is available on uh, Nyaya or Mimasa uh, in the Indian tradition, they don't have access to all of it. 
but uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, I think Schopenhauer had already had a lot of knowledge about Buddhism and Buddhism is the philosophy which stands on the concept of death. It is all about death in fact. Life is constructed on the basis of death. It begins from death, it ends in death. So um, I think you are oversimplifying to some, ex uh, to some extent that uh, Asian philosophy had uh, no influence directly or indirectly on him. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I, it is not clear uh, how much of influence uh, Schopenhauer... That is, a, uh, that is a different question. We are not sure how much influence is there. I am not claiming that there was influence, but there must be indirect influence. It cannot be. It cannot be there was no influence because Schopenhauer had already had a lot of knowledge on Buddhism. Schopenhauer's philosophy stands on Buddhism. You cannot just dismiss it so easily. And it is not also easy post-colonialism, I'm sorry to say. Um, um, from the little that, uh, uh, as I keep on saying, 102 volumes, from the little that I've read, uh, I have no idea, I have no idea of what Heidegger has to say about Schopenhauer. Right? Now, what I mean by that is, yes, it is possible to be more or less certain that uh, through nature uh, or directly Schopenhauer might have influenced uh, Heidegger. But this might have is, is not refutable. It is not negatable. Might have, yes, might have. I can't say no. I can't say no, which is a statement which is ambiguous. It is not a clear proposition which can be verified and said to be true or false. So it's an ambiguous statement to say that he must have been influenced. Right? He must have, yes, possibly. Might have been. Might have been, yes. The word might. No, but. <laughs> That that sort of goes into um, goes into. Uh, is, is, uh, I can only answer this in a speculative manner, not in a biographical manner. So the speculation is not very interesting to me. Any questions? Any, anybody? Yeah. This stage. When you said that Heidegger said philosophy was, uh, should be considered a European phenomenon, is that related to his whole notion of the limitations of European metaphysics? Um, or is he actually making that kind of uh, racist statement? I mean, I just don't, I can't see that he would be that dumb as, as to actually to I, make that I, I kind of... I hope so too, because uh, you know? I, I don't think, it's a bit like a... a, a a, a, a friend of mine who teaches philosophy and whose uh, opinions and judgments on philosophy I trust, uh, he tells me that when Hegel says that India does not have philosophy, that for him is a celebratory statement. Okay, so philosophy here is used the All these major philosophers, including Kant, they are trying to get out of the tradition. And the, the quickest way they can do it is to say, um, Go back to the Greeks. Go back to the Greeks. The Greeks are the most alien historically to them. And that's why all these claims that they are the origin, they are this, they are that, they, how many of them actually bother Heidegger, Foucault, they, the, whoever, how many of them actually bother to learn African languages? We are all talking only about Asia. How about African philosophy? There are whole websites devoted to African philosophy. What about African philosophy? What is its place? What is our relationship to African philosophy? That's a beautiful question, isn't it? <laughs>